this time I would like to, to study a little bit about that great man of God that stands at the mountain peak of Old Testament experiences, the man Elijah. In 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1, it introduces this man very abruptly, it says, And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. Who was this man, Elijah? Who was Elijah the Tishbite, who suddenly appears on the scene of action in relatively for a few short years, and then he disappears. Who was this man? What was his work? In Prophets and Kings, page 119, it gives us a little magnifying glass of that experience. Prophets and Kings 119 says, Among the mountains of Gilead, east of the Jordan, there dwelt in the days of Ahab a man of faith and prayer whose fearless ministry was destined to check the rapid spread of apostasy in Israel far removed from any city of renown, occupying no high station life, Elijah the Tishbite nevertheless entered upon his mission confident in God's purpose to prepare the way before him and to give him abundant success. The word of faith and power was upon his lips. And notice this next part of the sentence. Who was Elijah? It says, And his whole life was devoted to to the work of reform. Elijah the Tishbite did not just suddenly begin reform on this pinnacle of history and walk up to Ahab and suddenly show up. No, Elijah the Tishbite actually was a man whose entire life was devoted to the work of reformation. This is why God chose him to deliver that message to the king. His was the voice of one crying in the wilderness to rebuke sin and press back the tithe of evil. And while he came to the people as a reprover of sin, his message offered the balm of Gilead to the sin-sick souls of all who desired to be healed. So what was Elijah? Elijah was a man, not only a man, to speak about reproof and rebuke to the people. That's not what his whole work was. He also was a man that offered solutions to the problems. He came to offer the balm of Gilead to the sin-sick soul. He came to bring a remedy to Israel. Now, Elijah was not a man that said, Lord, I want to be a great messenger for you. No, he did not seek to do this work. In Prophets and Kings, page 120, it says, Elijah was entrusted the mission of delivering to Ahab heaven's message of judgment. He did not seek to be the Lord's messenger. The word of the Lord came to him. He did not ask for this job. God's word came to him. And jealous for the honor of God's cause, he did not hesitate to obey the divine summons, though to obey seemed to invite swift destruction at the hand of the wicked king. The prophet set out at once and traveled night and day until he reached Samaria. At the palace, he solicited no admission, nor waited to be formally announced. Clad in the coarse garments usually worn by the prophets of that time, he passed the guards apparently unnoticed and stood for a moment before the astonished king. What were some of the characteristics that made Elijah well known in his life? Well, we look at verse 1 once again to notice this characteristic. It says, And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. Elijah the Tishbite was known for being a man of stern rebuke. He makes no apology for his abrupt appearance. A greater than the ruler of Israel had commissioned him to speak, and lifting his hand toward heaven, he solemnly affirmed by the living God that the judgments of the Most High were about to fall upon Israel. He was a man that made no apologies for what he was about to do. His message was of God, and that message he must deliver. Now Ahab didn't like Elijah. Ahab really thought that the problem with Israel was Elijah. Let's look at 1 Kings chapter 18 and verse 17. 
1 Kings chapter 18 and verse 17. And it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? So what happened to Ahab? Ahab thought that the, all the problems were because of Elijah. Are you the one that is causing all these difficulties in Israel? Prophets and Kings 139. It is natural for the wrongdoer to hold the messengers of God responsible for the calamities that come as the sure result of a departure from the way of righteousness. So it is natural for those who are in the wrong to always blame the one who, stand, who did the reproving. Instead of looking at their own problems, what was the real cause, they blame the man of God. The reason for this is that those who place themselves in Satan's power are unable to see things as God sees them. When the mirror of truth is held up before them, they become indignant at the thought of receiving reproof. Blinded by sin, they refuse to repent. They feel that God's servants have turned against them and are worthy of severest censure. But you know, Elijah, true to his nature, does not waste words. When Ahab said, Are you the one that troubleth Israel? In verse 18 of chapter 18, Elijah responds, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, in that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Balaam. You see, Elijah re responded immediately, No, I am not troubling Israel. You are troubling Israel. But then, Elijah is specific. Elijah says, it is because you have turned away from God and you have followed Balaam. Elijah did not go into some long, detailed explanation of anything else. He went directly to the cause of the problem. It is because you have forsaken, notice there what? You have forsaken the commandments of the Lord. For this reason, Ahab wrongly considered Elijah as an enemy rather than a friend. Ahab really should have realized that Elijah was his friend. In 1 Kings chapter 21 and verse 20, we find another time that Elijah meets Ahab. And Ahab said to Elijah, Hast thou found me, O my enemy? Elijah answered, I have found thee, because thou hast sold thyself to work evil in the sight of the Lord. Elijah was also a man that brought people to a decision. You may remember the experience, and that's probably the major experience that we can think of Elijah, is there on Mount Carmel in 1 Kings 18 and verse 21. 1 Kings chapter 18 and verse 21. As he stood there, he says, Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered not a word. So Elijah was the one that was bringing people to a decision. Unfortunately, the people were in a state of indifference. They had no idea what they believed. They were afraid to make an answer. For that reason, in Prophets and Kings, page 148, it says, The Lord abhors indifference and disloyalty in a time of crisis in His work. When we think about all the sins that God hates, which sin do you think was the worst sin? Which sin of all the sins that, that exist in Israel, which sin do you think is the worst sin of all the other sins that God hates? You'd be surprised. Let's read this one here. Volume 3, Testing for the Church, page 280 to 81. Volume 3, 280 to 81. If God abhors one sin above another, of which his people are guilty, it is doing nothing in case of an emergency. If we do nothing in the case of an emergency, God hates that above anything else. Indifference and neutrality in a religious crisis is regarded of God as a grievous crime and equal to the very worst type of hostility against God. So what is considered the worst type of hostility against God? Indifference and neutrality in a religious crisis. That God hates more than anything else. 
Elijah was also a man of faith and action. In verse 41, 1 Kings chapter 18 and verse 41, 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 41. And Elijah said unto Ahab, Get thee up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. Elijah did not just talk about truths. Elijah dealt, had actions. You remember on this particular occasion, as the king could not see where he was going, Elijah ran in front of him and held the chariot and moved it to safety. But at times, even Elijah faltered. In Prophets and Kings 161 to 162, it talks about the shaky experience of Elijah. It says, but a reaction such as frequently follows high faith and glorious success was pressing upon Elijah. He feared that the reformation begun on Carmel might not be lasting, and depression seized him. He had been exalted to Pisgah's top. Now he was in the valley. While under the inspiration of the Almighty, he had stood the severest trial of faith. But in this time of discouragement, with Jezebel's threats sounding in his ears, and Satan still apparently prevailing through the plottings of the wicked woman, he lost his hold on God. He had been exalted above measure, and the reaction was tremendous. Forgetting God, Elijah fled on and on until he found himself in a dreary waste alone. Utterly weary, he sat down to rest under a juniper tree, and sitting there he requested for himself that he might die. He said, all right, it's enough. I am ready to die. Why did he get discouraged? Why did he get so discouraged that he began to run for his life? And keep in mind, he was just there on Mount Carmel. On top of Mount Carmel were all the prophets of Baal. All the army was there. Everyone was there. They could have killed him in a moment. He stood firm and faithful. And then all of a sudden he gets down there by that Jezreel. And Jezebel says, I'm going to kill you. And as soon as she says, I'm going to kill you, he packs up and runs away. Why was it? It's very simple. Many of us experience the same thing. When are we discouraged? When are we disappointed? It says, into the experience of all, there comes time of keen disappointment and utter discouragement. Days when sorrow is the portion, and it is hard to believe that God is still the kind benefactor of His earthborn children. Days when troubles harass the soul till death seems preferable, preferable to life. It is then that many lose their hold on God and are brought into slavery of doubt, the bondage of unbelief. Could we at such times discern with spiritual insight the meaning of God's providences? We should see angels seeking to save us from ourselves, striving to plant our feet upon a foundation more firm than the everlasting hills. New faith, new life would spring into being. Why does this happen? Number one, because we have high expectations. You know, Elijah expected the people to accept the Reformation like this. But when the Reformation did not happen so rapidly, when Ahab got frightened himself of Jezebel, then Elijah got discouraged. And that's why he went into this problem. And the same thing with us. We have high expectations. When those expectations are not met, we become discouraged. Page 167. Prophets and Kings 167. Not until Elijah had learned to trust wholly in God could he complete his work for those who had been seduced into Baal worship. You see here that Elijah had a problem. Although he was a man of stern rebuke, although he had said all those things that he did, he had yet to learn to trust fully upon God. He had not learned to trust totally upon God. That is where the problem was. And this is why the Lord asked Elijah a very important question. We find this in 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse 9. 1 Kings 19 and verse 9. And he came thither unto a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him and said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? What are you doing here, Elijah? Now, there was no real answer for that. You see, Elijah fled before. Elijah fled by the river Cherith, didn't he? By the brook. He fled there and he hid for three and a half years. He went up there to Zarephath. Why did he go to all these places? Because God sent him there. Now, who sent him to this cave? Nobody. And this is why God had a question for Elijah. What are you doing here? Are you my servant or are you not? What business have you 
here. Verse 13. Again, the question was asked him in verse 13. And the question is asked of us today. Prophets and Kings 172 to 173. Of families, uh, and as of individuals, the question is asked, What doest thou here? In many churches there are families well instructed in the truths of God's Word who might widen the sphere of their influence by moving to places in need of the ministry they are capable of giving. God calls for Christian families to go into the dark places of the earth and to work wisely and perseveringly for those who are enshrouded in spiritual gloom. The question is, what are we doing here? Are you sitting in a cave somewhere? You know, many times we get a little bit fearful for the last days. We think, oh, there's last days coming. We need to flee for our life. We need to go up in the mountains. We need to find ourselves a home secluded from everything in society. Let's go live up there. Is that our cave that we're hiding from? God asked the question, what are you doing there? We have a message to give to this world. Now, there are other characters of Elijah, which we'll talk a little bit later when we consider the work of Elijah. But we know that there's also a prophecy about this Elijah. Let's look at Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. The last two verses of the Old Testament. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. So it says here what? Behold what will happen. Before the coming of Christ, there will be what? Elijah will come. Who is Elijah? Volume 3, page 62. Volume 3, page 62. It says, Those who are to prepare the way for the second coming of Christ are represented by faithful Elijah as John came in the spirit of Elijah to prepare the way for Christ's first advent. So those people who are preparing the way for the second coming of Christ, they are the Elijah people. And this series of videos is devoted to a study about the characteristics and the work of the Elijah people in the last days. Those people who are preparing the way for the Lord. The question is, if you want to be among those people, you must have those characteristics. If I want to be among those people, I must have those characteristics. Now, what was the work of Elijah? Let us look at some of the things that Elijah had to do. What is the first major work of Elijah? Yes, he did go out there and tell Ahab, you know, that Ahab was in a sinner and therefore there will not be rain for three and a half years. That is true. But the real major work of Elijah began, well, many things happened. We read earlier he was a lifelong reformer, things of that nature. But the major work that we remind him, remember him of is on Mount Carmel. Now, what was he doing on that Mount Carmel? What was the major thing that he did there? Yes, we remember the lightning come from heaven and all that stuff, but what is the real work that he did? Let's look at 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 30 and 31. 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 30 and 31. 1 Kings 18, 30 and 31. And Elijah said it unto all the people, Come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took twelve stones, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. What's the first thing that he did? The first thing that Elijah did was to restore the family altar. The altar of the morning and evening sacrifice. In Prophets and Kings, page 151, it says, To him this heap of ruins is more precious than all the magnificent altars of heathenism. That was more valuable to him. And today we may have some very simple altars in which we worship in. And yet they are more precious to us than all the beautiful heathen temples. Now what was the secret of the power of Elijah? Verses 42 to 44. 
First Kings chapter 18, verses 42 to 44. So Ahab went up to eat and to drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel. And he cast himself down upon the earth and put his face between his knees and said to his servant, Go up now and look toward the sea. And he went up and looked and said, There is nothing. And he said, Go again seven times. And it came to pass at the seventh time that he said, Behold, there ariseth a little cloud out of the sea like a man's hand. And he said, Go up, say unto Ahab, Prepare thy chariot and get thee down, that the rain stop thee not. Elijah was a man of prayer. After all that thing that happened on the mountain, the Mount Carmel, the fire came down from heaven, burnt up the sacrifice. The people were dismissed. They said, The Lord, He is God. Elijah remains there on Mount Carmel and he remains to pray. We read about this in James chapter 5, verse 16 through 20. James chapter 5, verse 16 through 20. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converted the sinner from the error of his ways shall save a soul from death, and shall hide in a multitude of sins. The power of Elijah was in the power of prayer. When he restored that family altar, he went down and he had his private prayer. Do we want to have the same power of Elijah? In Gospel Workers, page 255, it tells us what has to happen to us if we're going to have the same power of Elijah. It says, when men are devoted as Elijah was, and possess the faith that he had, God will reveal himself as he did then. What do we need? What experience do we need in order to have the power of Elijah? Number one, we must be devoted. We must be devoted as Elijah was devoted. Number two, it says there, we must have the faith of Elijah. If we possess the devotion and we possess the faith of Elijah, it says here, then God will reveal Himself as He did then. Do you want God to reveal Himself to you? Do you want God to reveal Himself to us in our work? Then we must have the devotion and the faith of that man, Elijah. In Prophets and Kings 156 to 157, Prophets and Kings 156 to 157, it says, it was because Elijah was a man of large faith that God could use him in the, this grave crisis in the history of Israel. Elijah had large faith so God could use him. As he prayed, his faith reached out and grasped the promises of heaven. And he persevered in prayer until his petitions were answered. He persevered in prayer. Not just prayed, but he persevered. in prayer. If we want to have the success of Elijah, we must also persevere in prayer. It goes on. He did not wait for the full evidences that God had heard him, but was willing to venture all on the slightest token of divine favor. As soon as God showed that He was about to reveal Himself to him, as God showed one little bit of evidence, Elijah ventured everything on the fact that God was going to now answer his prayer. Page 157. Faith such as this is needed in the world today. Faith that will lay hold on the promises of God's Word and refuse to let go until heaven hears. So that's what persevering prayer is. It is to refuse to let go of God until God hears and answers our prayers. Are we prepared to have that type of experience? That's what we must have in order to have the experience of Elijah. 
We read this one already, page 119. The word of faith and power was upon his lips, and his whole life was devoted to the work of reform. So let's put on this next point here. If we want to have the experience and power of Elijah, his whole life was devoted to the work of reform. He devoted everything to the work of reformation. That's why God was able to use him. In volume 3, page 275, it said there, He, speaking of Elijah, ventured everything in the mission before him. He ventured everything. What did he venture? What did he risk? He risked everything for the cause of God. Unless you and I are willing to venture everything for the work of the Lord, we cannot be used by God to do the work of Elijah. Page 121. Had he not possessed implicit confidence in the one whom he served, he would never have appeared before Ahab. So what do we find here? He had implicit confidence, and that's faith. Faith is implicit confidence in God. Until we have implicit confidence, then God cannot use us. It says further in 156, He persevered in prayer until His petitions were answered. Faith, page 157, faith such as this is needed in the world today. Faith that will lay hold on the promises of God's Word and refuse to let go until heaven hears. This was the life work of Elijah. These are the things that made Elijah the man who he was, the man for the hour. Many times we like the glory of Elijah. We want to see all those wonderful things happen, but we're not willing to risk what Elijah risks. We need to have this experience. Elijah also was an educator of the youth. Let's look at 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 19 and 20. 1 Kings 19, 19 and 20. So he departed thence and found Elisha, the son of Shaphath, who was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen before him, and he with the twelfth. And Elijah passed by him and cast his mantle upon him. Now, who did Elijah go and find? He found Elisha to train Elisha to do what? To take his place. But by the way, whom did he choose? Did he go out there and find someone who was doing nothing? Oh, no. He found someone who was already involved in the work. This man was doing what? He was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen. And he with a twelfth. So he departed thence and found Elisha the Shaph, son of Shapheth, who was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen before him, and he with the twelfth. And Elijah passed by him and cast his mantle upon him. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Let me, I pray thee, kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow thee. And he said unto him, Go back again, for what have I done to thee? And he returned back from him and took a yoke of oxen and slew them and boiled their flesh with the instruments of the oxen, and gave unto the people, and they did eat. Then he arose and went after Elijah and ministered unto him. What's the first thing that Elisha did? Elisha took his entire life work that was before him. He took all of that. He burned it. He burned all his bridges. If we want to be trained by Elijah like Elisha, we need to burn all the bridges. What was the basis of Elijah, Elisha's training? 2 Kings chapter 3, verse 11. 2 Kings 3, verse 11. But Jehoshaphat said, Is there not here a prophet of the Lord, that we may inquire of the Lord by him? And one of the kings of Israel's servants answered and said, Here is Elisha the son of Shapheth, which poured water on the hands of Elijah. This was the training that he had. He had practical training. He didn't go out there and do all these wonderful things. He actually did the work of a servant. And that's how he received his training. 
This Elisha would not let a single opportunity of learning let it slip him by. In 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 1 to 6, 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 1 to 6, it says, And it came to pass when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind, that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. And Elijah said unto Elisha, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Bethel. And Elisha said unto him, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel. And the sons of the prophets that were in Bethel came forth to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? He said, Yea, I know it. Hold your, ye your peace. And Elijah said unto him, Elisha, tarry here, I pray thee. For the Lord hath sent me to Jericho. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they came to Jericho. And the sons of the prophets that were at Jericho came to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? He answered, Yeah, I know it. Hold ye your peace. And Elijah said unto him, Tarry, I pray thee here, for the Lord hath sent me to Jordan. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And they too went on. Notice here, each time was a test. A test was there to see whether it, how far Elisha will go. And it says here, Elisha refused to go away. In other words, Elisha took every advantage that he possibly could. For that reason, in Gospel Workers, page 101 to 102, it says, Let the older workers be educators, keeping themselves under the discipline of God. Let the young men feel it a privilege to study under older workers, and let them carry every burden that their youth and experience will allow. Thus Elijah educated the youth of Israel in the schools of the prophets. And young men today are to have a similar training. It is not possible to advise in every particular department that the youth should act, but they should be faithfully instructed by the older workers and taught to look ever to Him who is the author and finisher of our faith. As a result of this persistence, what blessing was given to him? Second Kings chapter 2 and verse 9. 2 Kings chapter 2 and verse 9. And it came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. He did not look for worldly wealth. He looked for something more important. He wanted that the Spirit of God in a double measure be placed upon him. Prophets and Kings 2.24 to 2.25. Another very important work in the work of reformation by Elijah. The schools of the prophets established by Samuel had fallen into decay during the years of Israel's apostasy. Elijah re-established these schools, making provision for young men to gain an education that would lead them to magnify the law and make it honorable. So another major work of Elijah was to reestablish the schools of the prophets. Now, he took Elisha and gave him personal training, but also he did the work of reestablishing the schools of the prophets. Counsels the parents, teachers, and students, page 42, also I think in volume 6, page 206. It says, As a people who claim to have advanced light, we are to devise ways and means by which to bring forth a corps of educated workmen for the various departments of the work of God. We need a well-disciplined, cultivated class of young men and women in the sanitarium, in the medical missionary work, in the office of publication, in the conferences of different states, and in the field at large. We need young men and women who have a high intellectual culture in order that they may do the best work for the Lord. We have done something toward reaching this standard, but still we are far behind that which the Lord has designed. As a church, as individuals, if we would stand clear in the judgment, we must make more liberal efforts for the training of our young people that they may be better fitted for the various branches of the great work committed to our hands. 
we should lay wise plans in order that the ingenuous minds of those who have talent may be strengthened and disciplined and polished after the highest order, that the work of Christ may not be hindered by the lack of skillful laborers who will do their work with earnestness and fidelity. So we find here that the work that is before us, the work of Elijah, is not only the work to rebuke, but it was also a work of building up, a work to establish something, establish training centers, and especially here, the training of our young people. In volume 6, page 197, volume 6, 197. No, I answered most decidedly not. What selection would be, we be able to make from our youth? This is deciding who can go there and who cannot. How can we tell who would be the most promising? Who would render the best service to God? In our human judgment we might do as did Samuel, who when sent to find the anointed of the Lord, looked upon the outward appearance. But the Lord said to Samuel, Look not on his countenance, nor on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Not one of the noble-looking sons of Jesse would the Lord accept. But when David, the youngest son, a mere youth, and the shepherd of the sheep, was called from the field and passed before Samuel, the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Who can determine which one of, the, of a family will prove to be efficient in the work of God? All the youth should be permitted to have the blessings and privileges of an education at our schools, that they may be inspired to become laborers together with God. In volume 18, manuscript releases, page 183. Volume 18, manuscript releases, page 183. My brethren in positions of responsibility, remember that you are not to keep in suspense the men and women who signify their desire to work for the Lord. Express your pleasure that they are willing to enter the work. Give them something to do. In Fundamentals of Christian Education, page 512. Fundamentals of Christian Education, page 512. If conducted as God designs they should be, our schools in these closing days of the message will do a work similar to that done by the schools of the prophets. The work of Elijah was a very important work. The work of Elijah was to arrest the attention of the people, to call them to a decision, to get them out of a state of indecision, because that is the worst, most obnoxious state that a person can be before God. And then Elijah began a work of training to establish things the way that God had in mind for them. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 14, people were talking about the coming of Elijah before the coming of Christ. And they asked Jesus about this. And in verse 14, in reference to John the Baptist, Jesus says, And if ye will receive it, this is Elias, which was for to come. In order for us to recognize the true Elijah and the Elijah people these last days, we must be willing to receive it. It says, If you will receive it, this was Elias, which was for to, for to come. It was unexpected. They, 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 he did not do this wonderful work they were looking for in Elijah. But those who had spiritual discernment, they recognized this as the Elijah. In Prophets and Kings, page 128, For stricken Israel, there was one remedy, a turning away from the sins that had brought upon them the chastening hand of the Almighty, and a turning to the Lord with full purpose of heart. That was the only thing. And it was the Elijah message that came to them that woke them up. Prophets and Kings 140 and 141. Today, there is need of the voice of stern rebuke. For grievous sins have separated the people from God. Infidelity is fast becoming fashionable. We will not have this man to reign over us is the language of thousands. The smooth sermons so often preached make no lasting impression. The trumpet does not give a certain sound. Men are not cut to the heart by the plain sharp truths of God's Word. 
Brethren, there is today a need of the voice of stern rebuke. On the next page it says, page 141, So men who should be standing as faithful guardians of God's law have argued till policy has taken the place of faithfulness and sin is allowed to go unreproved. And the question that is asked for us today, the question of most important value, is the next question. It says, When will the voice of faithful rebuke be heard once more in the church? Is it not high time now to hear the Elijah message?